Hamjambo, I want us to begin to talk about uh, bacterial pathogenesis and basically when you're talking about bacterial pathogenesis, what we are asking ourselves is how do bacteria make us sick and how do they make our patient become sick? So that is basically uh, what we are going to discuss and it's a very important thing that all of us understand that bacteria are the commonest uh, uh, cause of disease in man. So oh, I will be, uh, I'll begin by looking at um, some of those areas that I want us to discuss uh, basically. So we ask ourselves, how do they enter our body in the first, first, uh, in the first place, first of all? The roots, the roots are, they can be ingested, ingested, inhaled or through trauma or by uh, needles catheters or arthropod bite and sexual transmission. When you look at our, 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 our organ here of interest, uh, it is quite important that we look at, we need to also to understand that we have the respiratory route where we can get some of those bacteria through the respiratory route and commonest bacteria that cause respiratory infection are uh, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis that causes tuberculosis we also have streptococcus pneumoniae. Maybe you can add more examples on common bacteria that causes respiratory tract infection. We also have our mouth that can cause most of them cause uh, gastrointestinal infection. And common is the bacteria that cause gastrointestinal infection are so many. One is uh, Vibrio cholerae. We're going to talk about cholera. We have uh, typhoid caused by um, uh, Salmonella typhi and uh, so many other bacteria that I want us also to think out of the box and see which are those common bacteria that can be transmitted through the mouth and cause gastrointestinal problem. We also have one common bacteria that does not go down the intestinal tract, uh, the H. pylori that just stops at the stomach and has one specific adaptation that make it be able to cause gastrointestinal problem. Um, one of the tasks that you us to look, maybe I may not mention each one of the bacteria and how it is adapted to cause some of those common problems, but generally we'll be able to look at some of the mechanisms that bacteria is able to evade host immunological response, able to adhere to the host me membrane at the site of infection and be able to colonize and uh, multiply and cause uh, the pathogenic effect on the affected person. We also have the conjunctiva through the eyes. In the eyes, we get some of the commonest bacteria that can cause uh, some of the problems, such as eye infection. You can look at some of the bacteria that causes conjunctivitis. And through scratch injury, maybe you are scratched by an infected animal like the cat or through the insect of the arthropod, such as mosquito. Um, I want to say for sure that it is not so many bacteria that can be, there's not any bacteria that can be transmitted to the mosquito, but you also need to know that there are some other infections that are transmitted through mosquito. And sometimes when looking at the capillary, it might be maybe you get got a needle injury and probably you might get the bacteria going through your skin. And in that way, you can be able to see that bacteria need to enter your body for them to cause disease in you. Let's look at the characteristics of pathogenic bacteria. One of the characteristics is transmittability. Is it being able to transmit, be transmitted from one person to another one? Does it require a vector or does it not require a vector? Is it transmitted from one uh, human to animals, such as zoonotic infection, or it is transmitted through man to man or through the respiratory route, through sexual contact and such ways? Adherence to the host, the bacteria has to be able to attach itself, stick there. You, it needs to be able to be there and adhere there and multiply. So that means that adherence is quite a good uh, way that the bacteria can be able to uh, attach itself so that it can be able now, the next stage is inversion, invade the host cell and tissue. So other than the place of uh, infection, it needs also to spread to the other cells or to other tissues or other organs. Evasion of the host immune response, it is quite an important part so that the bacteria can be able to escape. 
the immunological response the horse has so you have the immune cells you have the antibodies you have all the other chemicals that are produced such as interferon those chemicals need to be evaded we have the complement uh, chemicals those complement chemicals uh, uh, should be able to be evaded anyway for that so that the, the bacteria can be able to cause disease in you toxigenicity is it able to produce the toxins we have exo and endotoxins so toxins can be produced are produced in those two ways so the endotoxins the cell of the bacteria have to be broken down for the toxin to be released exotoxins are released outside the cell even before you were able to use the bacteria in 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 video or adhere to you or is transmitted into you that toxin is already produced so it is most of the time is pre-formed toxins at times it does not need to be preformed maybe it needs to invade to evade to invade uh, your tissues so it's multiply and then in the end as it produces on uh, metabolites byproducts it also produces some of the toxins bacteria may cause disease by destroying tissues producing toxins and stimulating overwhelming host immune responses such as fever uh, triggering the complement system inflammation and all those compli compli uh, complicated immunological response that comes as a result of infection damage the host cell damage the host cell using host nutrients that is when damage will happen because if the nutrients are utilized where will the cell get the nutrients from for example ion is quite an important uh, element that aids in transport electron transport chain through the cytochromes and both the host and, and the pathogens require iron direct damage to the colonized area growth and duplication in the host cell results in the host cell uh, soil lysis penetration through the cell the host cell mucosa causes damage as well lysis of the host to obtain nutrients is also a very good mechanism that this bacteria can cause can be able to do and impact the cell and in the end of the day the cell dies the bacteria gets the nutrients after the cell dies and that is how it's able to survive in the end of the day production of the toxins uh, production of toxin i think we said that we have exo and endotoxin the toxins can be within the cell membrane of the of the bacteria or they can be produced extracellularly how do bacteria cause disease in man? One is adherence. Adherence is attachment to the host by the microbes at the portal of entry and usually necessary for virulence. If it is not adhered, it has not attached itself to you, then it will not be able to uh, continue multiplying within you because it will not be new anyway. So blocking adhesion can be a way that the immune system can be able to uh, actually prevent uh, colonization of this bacteria pathogen has surface molecule called adhesins or ligands that binds specifically to the host cell receptors and this is what helps this bacteria to adhere to you remember these surface molecules are specific and uh, that's where you will be able to get that there are specific bacteria that causes respiratory infection specific bacteria that causes um, UTI, urinary tract infection, there are specific bacteria that causes skin infection. But it is very hard to be able to find some of those bacteria causing other problems other than what they are normally able to cause. Most host receptors are typically proteins or carbohydrates and uh, in the walls or the membrane of the host cell so these receptors are the one that are cognized by the bacteria so that this bacteria can be able to adhere there if those receptors are not there then adherence is going to be made impossible because they will not be able to attach the appropriately or accordingly and that means that they can be cleared off through the sweeping mechanism of the the host skin membrane or the mucous membrane can be able to clear them out they may not be able to attach themselves permanently so that colonization and multiplication can take place at the site of infection and thus uh, being able to be stopped from them when you're talking about biofilms as a nurse as a clinical officer you always have come across something called catheters 
or surgical implants. These are very important areas and when you're talking about disinfecting them, sterilizing them before, sterilizing the surfaces and uh, the places where you're going to insert some of this, it is very important. Biofilms are formed when microbes are there on the surface and that is usually moist and contains organic matter. The biofilm is resistant to disinfectants and antibiotics. This is quite a dangerous way, a dangerous and very uh, harmful way that the bacteria can be able to grow. What we mean by biofilm it means that we form a layer, one layer of of bacteria growing on top of another one, another one, another one. It can be the same species or different species uniting together to be able to colonize that area. And this is quite a very big problem, especially patients with catheter, patients who are having implants, and this is what is going to cause most of the complication among such type of patients. When we talk about the capsule, we are talking about the outside covering of the bacteria, the extra on top of the, the normal bacteria that we know, either gram positive or gram negative, it has uh, uh, the, the outside covering. So the, on top of the outside covering, there are things that, uh, that are quite important to be able to understand. Like if I look at this as our bacteria, that is our bacteria. So normally we have the cell membrane, the cell wall, the cell wall that is. The bacteria does not have a cell membrane. Of course the cell membrane might be there, but the cell wall of the bacteria is this part, this part that I'm labeling. So, and then maybe we have our genetic material that is normally uh, inside here. So, on top of the normal cell wall of the bacteria, we also have another covering that covers the outside of this bacteria. And this covering is what we call a, cap a capsid. It's very protective and helps it to be able to prevent it from being engulfed or being destroyed by the uh, leukocyte. If present, it's usually required for virulence and some are non-antigenic. Non-antigenic means that it, it makes it not be recognized by some of these uh, important uh, leukocytes such as the macrophages. So they are not recognized as pathogenic. And in the end, they end up confusing the leukocytes and continue to multiply and colonize the affected part. M protein, M protein A of Streptococcus pyogenes is heat and acid resistant and mediates attachment of the bacterium to the epithelial cells and resists phagocytosis by leukocytes. So those are the specific proteins that the bacteria can have to be able to evade the immunological response and colonize the surface that it is uh, it, uh, it has gotten into fimbriae. We also have fimbriae. We the fimbriae or an upper membrane protein used by Neisseria gonorrhea is a uh, promotes attachment and uptake by host epithelial cells and leukocytes. So this one helps it to attach itself and uptake by the host so that it can be able to be taken in by the host cell. So Neisseria then grows inside this cell. So once it has been uptaken, uptaken, let's say it has taken, been taken by the epithelial cells, then it can be able to colonize this area and be able to uh, multiply inside there and cause a lot of uh, patho pathological effect. So let's look at mycolic acid or waxy. So this normally out the outside covering of the mycobacterium tuberculosis. It is different from the capsid in that it has what you call a waxy uh, uh, outside. It's very waxy and resists digestion by phagocytes. And mycobacterium dust is able to grow inside the phagocyte and cause and multiply inside and uh, probably cause a lot of issues within the lungs where it will have colonized uh, in the end of the day. So let's look at enzymes. We have exoenzyme. Uh, these are uh, examples, exoenzymes are released. So exo means outside. So they are released outside the cell of the bacteria. 
So we have coagulases that helps to close to create protective barrier against the host defenses. Kindness dissolve clots to allow escape from isolated wound. So let's look at clot fibrin, the cloaglases. They clot fibrin in blood to create protective barrier. So this bacteria has a protective barrier outside it so that it is not being able to be attacked by other cell, other immune cells. So it looks like it has its the covering from the host. The covering is is adapted from the blood so that it can be able to create a covering so that one of the cells within the immune system cannot recognize it and this is very protective for it to be able to survive when looking at kinases they solve the clot so that means that if you formed a clot still the bacteria should the bacteria get in touch in contact at that area it will be able to escape from uh, from uh, that area and be able to cause uh, infection Neuraminidase is produced by intestinal pathogens and degrades neuraminic acid between the cells. What binds and holds the cells together is neuraminic acid. Neuraminic acid is, is very important in holding the cells together. So what will happen as now, therefore, the cells will disintegrate. And that means that the bacteria now will be able to colonize that area without any disturbance. Hyaluronidase is another enzyme that hydrolyzes the hyaluronic acid the glue that okay uh, that one I said um, this also acts as a glue that holds together connective tissues and epithelial barriers allowing deeper inversion and and the clostridium species are the one that are able to utilize this way and cause a lot of problems Clostridium have Clostridium perfringens, Clostridium uh, tetani, and other bacteria that are in the species or in the genus Clostridium. I'll give you a task. The task is to identify more bacterial enzymes that enable them to cause disease in man. And when you get this slide here on the bottom, you get some little guidelines so that now you'll be able to know and probably if there's not and, and not some of them that have not been mentioned there you can be able to read more and understand so that you can be able to be with me because i can't talk about everything here but i believe you also get your time to be guide uh, to read more and this i just act as a guide so antigenic variation is um, this is when a bacteria or any other infectious agent changes it it changes in terms of be, being recognized as an antigen. So that means that if specific memory cells were created to eradicate, for example, Neisseria gonorrhoeae, then they will not be able to attack Neisseria gonorrhoeae if it is within the system because it's changed. It's not the same because it has altered its appearance and its structure and that needs more memory cells so that it can be able to, uh, to keep in touch, to keep up with the speed of it changing from one form to another one. And that means that antibodies may not be effective, but more antibodies need to be recruited so that they can be able to actually clear the new enemy and uh, adapt and be able to eliminate Neisseria gonorrhoeae bacteria within the system. Endotoxins. Endotoxins um, are toxins that are within the cell wall of the bacteria. The cell wall of the bacteria, and most of those are gram-negative bacteria, such as um, uh, gram-negative bacteria, such as uh, um, Salmonella typhi, which are gram negative bacteria. Some of them, when they lyse, when they get lysed, they are able to release the toxin because the toxin is within the matrix of the soil wall of the bacteria. So it is that disintegration once, once that bacteria has been disintegrated through the, the macrophages, that is when they are able to release these toxins. And these toxins may cause a lot of problems such as leukopenia or leukocytosis and then leukocytosis leukopenia means that reduction of uh, leukocytes and then leukocytosis means that some of those cells are dying and uh, this results to uh, may also result in a toxic or septic or gram-negative shock 
may also result to hypotension and collapse and life-threatening complication of gram-negative sepsisemia and impaired organ perfusion and acidosis activation of C3 and the complement cascade. So the C3 is the complement uh, system is activated. Now remember the complement system is a trigger of the inflammation and a trigger of other chemicals that will, will cause a lot of severe form of immunological response as a result of this infection. Disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC, is also one of the outcome of endotoxin. Death is also one of the effect of uh, endotoxin. And most of the effect of endotoxins are mediated by tumor necrosis factor. Tumor necrosis factor means that uh, there will be necrosis and death, cell death, and that means that within the site of infection, several cells are dying and causing a very big gap there. And that is what we mean by necrosis. So let's look at how endotoxins happen. Dead gram-negative bacteria, as you can see, release endotoxins, which induces effects such as fever, inflammation, diarrhea, shock, and blood coagulation. So let's look at exotoxin. Maybe uh, somebody need to understand what is happening here. Um, when you're looking at here, okay, so... When you're looking at here, so, so this is our phagocyte. It has just engulfed this bacteria here. So once it has engulfed this bacteria here, what will happen? The bacteria will be degraded. Once it has been degraded or broken down, then there will be a release of what we call uh, endotoxin through exocytosis. Exocytosis is the release of uh, anything within the cell. So the phagocyte that has phagocyte, uh, phagocyte is a gram-negative bacteria, is now able to release the broken down a byproduct, and this byproduct can go into the red blood cell, the vessels, and the dead gram-negative bacteria can really cause a lot of the red blood cells is within the vessels and that one may the out one of the outcomes can be fever inflammation diarrhea shock blood coagulation problem and even can cause death so let's look at exotoxin exotoxins exotoxins are toxins that are released outside the cell you don't need to the, the cells don't need to die or to be lies so that they're exotoxins can be released. So the bacterial toxin form, form pores in eukaryotic cell membrane. That's one effect of exotoxin. Example of exotoxin is tropolysin O of streptococcus pyogenes, the sterilizing of listeria monocytogen, other toxins such as phospholipase, degrade components of membrane, uh, AG clostridium perfringens, alpha toxin. So uh, we'll be talking more about the exotoxin so let's look at how the mechanism of exotoxin happens. So once the bacteria, you can real, you realize that the bacteria, as they multiply and colonize the cells of the body, they are also producing this, this, this uh, toxins. So these are the toxin, the exotoxins that are produced. So you don't need these bacteria to die so that they can cause problems to you. So. So as they go, then you'll be able to realize that the whole cell, uh, the whole cell to be able to be uh, broken down because the pores are punctured and release their content. So when one cell has been affected, other cell will also be affected the same way. And that one means that if this cell are lining the respiratory tract or the GAT of the human being, then there will be a lot of uh, malabsorption or there will be problems with uh, oxygen perfusion and so many other things. So the bacteria secretes the exotoxin, in this case, acetotoxin. Acetotoxin is a toxin that is going to uh, kill the cell. Acetotoxin kills most of the cell. And this is how necrosis may occur because if several cells are dying within one site, then there will be uh, a big wound that will be created in the end of the day. 
So let's look at another toxin, diphtheria toxin. It is released by Corine bacteria, diphtheriae. It inhibits protein synthesis in eukaryotic cell. And erythrogenic toxin that is uh, causes uh, scarlet fever damages the plasma membrane of blood capillaries. One task I want to ask you, what causes scarlet fever? What causes scarlet fever? I'll give you some time. Think about that and then get to tell me or I try to understand what causes scarlet fever. So botulinum toxin is caused by Clostridium botulinum. And this is an AB neurotoxin which inhibits the release of acetylcholine in a neurotransmitter junction. So AB means that one side and the other side, they need to be a communication. Uh, that means that if, if side A, the information need to go to side B, then during that process of transformation, uh, transferring information so that the nervous uh, impulses can be able to be transmitted from one area to the next one, then that A to B uh, nervous transmission is cut off. And that means that uh, there will be a problem with the specific muscles that are supposed to be able to be excited or to, co to do a certain function. So I'll also give you another time to be able to look more into details. How does the, the release of acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction uh, inhibited, when inhibited, how will it affect the specific muscle that has been affected? Tetanus toxin, Colostridium tetani, enters the host through the wound, the skin, and then it replicates. And once infection is established, C. tetani produces two exotoxins, tetanolysin and tetanospasmin. Tetanolysin uh, is a hemolysin. Hemolysin means that it kills and destroys the red blood cells. Tetanospasmin blocks the release of inhibitory neurotransmitter. When you're looking down in the my slide, you'll get an, a, a complete information on the outcome because this will affect the muscles and the muscles will contract. And if the muscle has contracted now, it is not going to relax anymore and that will cause a deformity in the affected part of the body. So the mechanism on how that is happening is uh, is as as effect is as a result of the toxin that has been released by Clostridium tetani. So let's look at Vibrio cholerae. Vibrio cholerae, as you know, it affects the it needs to be taken through with food, and uh, it is an enterotoxin that means that it affects the small intestine, the GIT, the gastrointestinal tract, and specifically the small intestine. It in, it it results to increased CMP secretion of water and electrolytes and resulting to diarrhea. When you're looking at this uh, image, that is the lining of the small intestine. And that is the bacteria. That is the bacteria. It has that extension. The flagella. So this bacteria is going to cause to release an exotoxin. So the cholera toxin released into the intestinal epithelial cells increases calcium uh, chlorine ion excretion, chlorine ion uh, excretion, increased luminal ion concentration, increased luminal ion concentration and leads to increase in water excretion and results in watery diarrhea. And this is quite a very big problem, especially among patients who are diarrhea, who have cholera for that case. So let's look at how bacteria spreads in a, in a nutshell. They spread through cells and organs. So that is if they affected one area, it means from the cell and even to the tissues and organs. Within the macrophages itself, so that means that within the macrophages, there's some of these bacteria are able to spread and through blood and within the cell. So bacterial diseases can, be, uh, can, can, can come about in several overlapping ways. Um, some bacteria are never part of the normal flora, but may cause infection, e.g. mycobacterium tuberculosis. Some bacteria which are part of the normal flora acquire virulence factors, making them to be pathogenic, e.g. Escherichia coli, 
and some bacteria from the normal flora can cause a disease if they gain access to the deep tissue by trauma surgery lines, especially if associated with for example, Staphylococcus epidermidis. In immunocompromised patients, many free living bacteria and components of the normal flora can cause disease, especially if introduced in deep tissue such as Acinobacter. So this is the end of my discussion. But you need also to realize that uh, I will never be able to be exhaustive as much as possible. But it's just giving you a guideline of what you're supposed to know as far as my, uh, bacterial pathogenesis is concerned. Because if you're looking at a specific bacteria, for example, uh, Vibrio cholerae, we also, when you're talking about microbial uh, bacterial pathogenesis of such a bacteria, you need to look at the port of entry. How does it go? How does it come to be able to establish itself within the stomach of a person? It has to be taken through with water, goes through the mouth, goes through and overcomes the stomach acid, go and colonizes the small intestine. Then it's able to colonize the small intestine, produces the toxin, the, uh, the cholera toxin. Then the cholera toxin is able to do what it's able to do. Then the signs and symptoms is only to be explained simply, and the outcome of that uh, toxin is what makes somebody to have diarrhea, gas, uh, vomiting, and uh, develop even fever as a result of uh, uh, the, the toxins going into the, the immunological system, triggering excess immunological response. So basically, if you look at other bacteria, like in my book that I have here, so when you're looking at this book that I'm using as my reference, oh, it's coming upside down. It is uh, tropical diseases, monsoons, tropical diseases. It really gives you it gives you a guide of clearly what you're supposed to know. For example, if I open uh, uh, one of the commonest bacteria uh, that maybe is very known for all of us is shigellosis. What this book may give you is that uh, it tells you like shigella, it produces, and that is one extra toxin that you also need to know, is shiga toxin. Shiga toxin is, um, is like what they said, is that the, it causes uh, a bigger problem by causing inflammation uh, on the mucosal ridges and the blood vessels are congested, thrombosed, and there are large areas of hemorrhages within blood-stained mucus and mucus mucotopus. So basically what I have given you just today is a guide, and I believe if you're able to get e-books uh, e on the bacteria, you have an idea on how really some of those bacteria are able to cause disease in man and cause a lot of uh, problems, and you understand the concept behind. So when you're we're going to learn more about uh, the drugs, then you understand that when as much as you're giving antibiotics, you also need to be able to give other drugs that will help to, uh, to stabilize the patient. Like if a patient is diarrhea, you just not give antibiotics, you also need to give uh, rehydrate, you have to rehydrate the patient. Just simply because the patient is also losing water, as much as you want to clear the bacteria, you also need to uh, rehydrate the patient so that the, 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 the fluid that is lost is also known. For, I think basically that is what I want to sum up my discussion today. And if you have any question, I'll, I'll be very happy to be engaged on MLIMU and of course on my YouTube channel. We can be able to discuss more and help each other there. Have a good day and I hope you enjoyed my presentation.